What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of JAR. JAR, for those of you that may be new, stands for Joe. And Amy. Review. This is our weekly show where we review the magic stories. I'm going to stop it there for now. Uh, if you've seen past shows, there is usually more to come after that. But for now, this is our weekly show where we review the magic stories. Um, this week, we are here for part two of our review of War of the Spark Ravnica by Greg Weissman. So if you missed last week, I highly encourage you to go check that out. Uh, yes. from us. It will give you a lot of context for this week. Um, one thing I will say before we get into really anything regarding this review, first I wanted to say this Monday, so check when this video was posted, but this Monday, July 1st, 2019, is the Corset 2020 preview stream mm -hmm. sponsored by Wizards of the Coast. And we have done it in the past. We are super grateful to have been asked back for, I believe, the third in a row now yeah. um, to be sponsored by Wizards of the Coast again. We will be receiving a fully unlocked account um, with multiple, uh, lots of gems that we'll be using to play sealed all night. Um, so the event, I believe, starts at like, like 11 o'clock in the morning Eastern or something like that. Amy and I have work. Actually, you'll be off that day, but I have work. Um, and so... I will uh, not be able to get started, or we will not be starting, until around 5 p.m. Eastern. So be aware of that. Stay tuned to this YouTube channel. We'll be right here live on YouTube. Um, you can get notified if you're not following us on Facebook and Twitter. We will post it there as well. So stay informed as to when we will be up and running. We would love to see each and every one of you. So on to the actual jar. Just wanted to make sure that we got that out there for all of you so that you don't miss out. Um, uh, if uh, For a quick reminder, both of us, if I recall correctly, said last week that our quick review was, you should read the book. Um, and obviously we cannot summarize the entire book in these videos. We're only planning on doing about three parts, so yeah. that would be way too much um, to, to have to summarize an entire novel. Um, in these videos. Not doing it. It's also not really appropriate because we wouldn't necessarily do it justice. And so um, there are many conflicting reports out there, is my opinion of, of what I've seen, of whether people liked it or disliked it. We both believe that it is worth your time to read it, especially if $30 is not a huge deal for you. If it's if it's like, you know, that would make or break you uh, financially, then sure, maybe hold off for a little while. But I think it's worth, I think it's worth the time. I think it's worth the read. Well, I would hope that if $30 would make or break you, you know, you would just decide to save it instead of spending it on basically anything. Unless Fair. Unless it was way more important than a novel. Book. Sure. Agreed. So, uh, also, quick reminder, I am working off of the assumption, I believe we, we can, I, I believe I can safely say we, but feel free to correct me, um, are working off of the assumption, because it's our opinion, that this novel was written for people new to Magic Story. Yes. And so a lot of things that some people might find unforgivable, we find forgivable because we are working off of that assumption. And so instead of us saying that throughout this video, just realize that that assumption is interwoven throughout our analysis. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So with this video, I thought, because the since we broke it up into three parts, we would do like the first third, the second third, and the third third. So this is the second third, as confusing as all of that the is. Third, third. Exactly. Um, the final third. Uh, but this is the second third. And this had a lot of Planeswalker discussions, right? A lot of different Planeswalkers, a lot of different characters, really. Um, but Planeswalkers more specifically because that's kind of the whole thing of War of the Spark. Right. Right. Um, and... We discussed last week that there we thought that there were issues with characterization in this story. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, with there being issues of characterization, um, sometimes planeswalkers can be mischaracterized. <laughs> in fact, often. But there are so there are some examples here of that where I think there was where we think there was mischaracterization and some things we wanted to shout out uh, for positivity as well. This is not going to be a bashing stream or, or video, not stream, we talked about that earlier. Um, this is not going to be a, a fully bashing video on the book. There will be negatives and positives as we try to do in uh, all of our jars. It's just that with some of the parallel stories that we've been reading recently, it may not, 
Uh, if you're, it's if been you difficult. were, yeah, if you were new to us for just the rat stories, you may not know that we actually try to say nice things as well. Right. Um, let's talk about Angrath first, if you don't mind. Okay. Angrath was in these stories, and he, or was in this novel, and he talked about the fact that, you know, every once in a while he, he would say something that I thought was really cool. Um, like, I, I've been trapped by that sun once before. I will not let it trap me again. Mm -hmm. You know, saying that it needs to be taken down or whatever. And then just being a general badass with his molten chain and he's whipping it around and killing tons of Eternals all around him. He's telling people to get the well, hell sure. out of the way. Yeah, basically. Absolutely. Exactly like that. Um, and he's, he's whipping it all around and, and hitting uh, all the Eternals and, and killing a bunch of them. Um, I had a flavor question. So, Angrath kills Eternals in this story. That's almost exclusively what he does, besides just being generally ornery, because they need someone to be generally ornery, and why not Angrath? Do that? Uh, some, some people might Michael think... Bolas? Yeah, yeah. I mean, amongst the group of walkers trying to figure out what to do against Bolas, but, um... But yeah, so Angrath was definitely anger dad, if you will, uh, in, in, in these stories. Um, and I feel like I was a little confused, though, because we saw the cards spoiled and previewed and played with them before the book, the novel, came out. And Angrath gives all your creatures menace, which makes sense. Okay. He's very intimidating. I get it. What I don't get is... Why is his other ability, and his only other ability, his minus ability, to make zombie armies? Because he kills them a lot, so he creates them on his cards so that he's, they're there so he could kill them. I don't get it. I didn't understand it. Because, like, when I looked at it, here's the way I looked at Nicol Bolas. He had Tezzeret, who was blue-black. He had Ralzeric, who was blue-red. Or at least at the time, we thought he had Ralzeric. Um, back at the end of Amonkhet, an hour of devastation. And so, since Nicol Bolas is Grixis, blue-red-black, the only color he was still missing, combination at least of, of two colors, was red-black. And the new Planeswalker that had been introduced between Hour of Devastation and War of the Spark that was red-black was Angrath. Okay. And so when his card was previewed and it showed that Angrath made um, Eternals or, or zombie army tokens, I swore that was what was going to happen. Is that Angrath was going to in some way work for Bolas or help him right. or, or like just in general be ornery and sabotage the planeswalkers because he just doesn't care about anybody else a la uh, what Obnixilis kind of turned into at right. a small portion of the story at one point. Um, and so because of the flavor on Angrath's card, that's what I assumed was going to happen. That's not at all what happened. And that's not a knock on the novel, it's just a confusion with the novel contrasting with the cards. Right. Because if you're going to say, well, he killed a lot of Eternals, well... Based on the novel, so did a Johnny, so did Gideon, so did um, Karn, right? These big, beefy characters, Semut even, right. did uh, yeah. super well running around and stabbing and slashing and, and doing all of her crazy attacks and stuff. None of them made zombie armies. And so maybe you needed a Planeswalker to make zombie armies, and that was your only choice, because uh, Tezzeret wasn't in the set proper. Um, so it would have been weird for the Tezzeret Biobox promo that was only going into Standard to make the zombie armies. Yeah. Um, and Dovin Bond was your other option, and based on the novel, Dovin Bond would have been best making Thopters because of what we saw with him in the novel. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. It was very weird and confusing to me, yeah. and maybe it was just me. but Or maybe it was just us then, because Amy is, is here agreeing with me. Do you... Yeah, I mean, it's weird. I didn't necessarily think about it at the time, mm -hmm. but, I mean, it seems like it's just a simple mechanics thing, where when they were, you know, maybe even just playtesting uh, 
the, the set, they were like, mm, this needs to occur. Where can it be put? You know, right. um, sort of at the end kind of thing. Um, and that would make perfect sense, except then the story better reflect that. Instead right. Of being the opposite. Right. Because so. uh, they did what I thought was a pretty good job, at least in the parallel stories, and this is probably one of the more positive things I can say about it, of the descriptions that were given either in the novel and then mirrored in the par uh, parallel stories, or the parallel stories kind of threw them in there, they did a really good job of making it so that the parallel stories could throw in an image from a card from War of the Spark mm -hmm. and have it be very pertinent to what was just described mm -hmm. in the text. Yeah. Um, and so with that flavor parallel, no pun intended, I was surprised then by this incongruity yeah. with Angrath. That's all. Okay. Um, and a point that you had brought up um, that I wanted to touch on was with Kaya. Um, Kaya, I think, was well represented in this novel. I okay. think she had a pretty interesting... Sorry. A lot of... We, we missed a lot with the prequel stories not being included yeah. prior to the actual novel, and yet the novel being written assuming that we knew what happened in the prequel right. stories. So Kaya's beginning occurred in the prequel stories and we missed that mm -hmm. so she didn't have a very good beginning but she had a, a kind of a, a slight retelling of i'm in charge of the orzov now and i have all their debts and they're weighing me down right. and they slow me down a bit and we learned even i think much later in the story but we learned a bit about her powers in terms of um the fact that or at least we did I, if we learned about this previously and we just don't recall that's a possibility as well but um, we learned that she, when she goes into her ghost form, or her phasing form, um, she has to keep one part of her body unfazed in order to be able to continue to breathe. Uh, otherwise, she has to, like, hold her breath, fully ghost, and then come out and then try to breathe again as if she's going under and above water. Right. Um, and she kind of strained with that during the final battle, and she told us about that. So we learned a lot about Kaya. She had a, a pretty interesting arc, and then, as we know through the cards and then through the novel, she then takes the oath and joins the Gatewatch. Right. Um, and we can talk about that in the in the third third a little bit more. But um, but I thought that, that one of the things that was interesting, and, and you brought it up really, mm -hmm. was um, the decision that Kaya made when Rat she and Teo were, were stuck in an alley and they were trying to get through a doorway into a building. And uh, the building, the door was locked. And Rat was like, oh, I can pick the lock. And Kaya was like, well, so can I. And Teo's just throwing up a shield and blocking all of the Eternals from, right. who are trying to come at them and kill them. And Rat... Thanks, Teo. <laughs> and Rat tries to pick the lock and succeeds, but there's still something on the other side blocking it from being opened. So Kaya's like, well, I got this. And she goes through and gets to the other side. And then it's going to be a bit of a trial for her to get this door open. And she thinks for a second that she could just leave. Right? You remember that? Okay. And I think it was something that you wanted to touch on. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to talk about the characterization there and whether you think it's a good or a bad thing the way that, that, that she was characterized there. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. <sighs> I feel like it's kind of random for them to wait till this point for that to go through her mind. Okay. Uh, especially, as you mentioned when we spoke about it, uh, the fact that she's an assassin uh, and does not deal with children. I mean, <laughs> yeah, th there were plenty of opportunities where that thought would have run through her mind and it would have made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. At this point... I felt like it was late and weird. So I think the only, I think the benefit for Teo and Rat, at least, was that they were in mortal peril, right? Whereas in the past, when uh, Kaya is spending time with Rat and Teo, they're not in mortal peril. They're yeah. just hanging around with Kaya and she's okay with it. And so if that question had come up, as you, as you mentioned, prior, then she may very well have been like, screw this, and just been able to leave, and then it would not have been able to further the story in the way that it did. Right. Whereas at this moment, it was allowed, Kaya was allowed to have 
that hero moment of, no, I'm not going to leave these two behind. They're children and or just and young. they're in peril. Right, young and innocent and, and need saving, and I can save them or I can just leave. Mm -hmm. And any regular assassin, when w even with a heart, would just say, like, I'm not dealing with children, I'm out of here earlier on. But once they were in mortal peril, then she can't morally just, just leave them. Yeah. So... I think that may be why it they waited, and yes, it, it's it's convenient right. that 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 is her sticking point. But at the same time, I thought it was an interesting dichotomy of she's an assassin, she's a lone wolf, she does a job, she she gets a job, she does the job, and then she moves on to the next job. Right. Right. Now, of course, she is uh, leader of the Orzov Guild, and so she kind of has to stay in one place for longer. So that's a bit of a change for her to begin with, but. Mm -hmm. It still was the idea of... Well, and all of a sudden, because of that, she's got all these responsibilities. And then now on top of it, she's got these two kids with her that are in peril. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so there, there's a lot of um, layers of responsibility that she kind of has thrust upon her mm -hmm. uh, in a kind of quick manner. Um so I could see why she would have that thought, but at the same time, um, why? <laughs> I mean, um, you know, man up. <laughs> you know, uh, there are kids in peril uh, that, that trumps whatever your problem is. Fair enough. I, 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 do, though, I do, though, appreciate that we are actually getting the opportunity to discuss motivations behind a particular character mm -hmm. and not just saying why would they do this it makes zero sense right, like at yes. least at least there's arguments on both sides for this mm -hmm. as opposed to the vivian reed discussion like we had last right, week where it was right, like right. she wouldn't do this just you, completely right, incorrect right. you just yeah you just did this because it was convenient right exactly so i i appreciate that we can actually do that and and uh, yeah this was seemingly deliberate yes i just don't know how much sense it necessarily made but I can give it you know a 95% on the <laughs> make sense o meter I don't know <laughs> Jesus <laughs> okay fair enough uh, next I wanted to talk about Jace for a little bit so Jace is the character whom we follow or whose head we are in uh, for chapter 25 which I think is one of the best chapters in the book, just kind of overall, I think the second third in general is one of is my favorite of the thirds. Okay. Uh, me personally, um, I think that there's a lot of good opportunities for characters to shine, and so this chapter with Jace has him. He's thinking about Bolas's plan. He's kind of off on his own. He's like kind of dealing with the Eternals here and there, but he's otherwise doing fine. He can make himself invisible, make copies of himself. So he has the opportunity to be a little bit isolated and doing whatever the hell he wants. And he's thinking about Bolas's plan. He's thinking about Liliana. And we can talk about Jason Liliana maybe next time. Uh, cause I didn't, I didn't really write it down, but if you really want to get into it now, we can no, as well. But I definitely don't. Okay. So next time. Um, but I've got too much to say and none of it's good. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> but so in terms of, he's still sitting there thinking about Bolus's plan, how it relates to Liliana, et cetera, having I'm nothing sorry, to do with their guys. I am so itchy. Oh, I was, I was, I was doing the nose I thing really too. I really yeah. apologize yeah. for how much I am like fidgeting <laughs> and scratching. I don't know why. I just try to ignore it, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. Fair enough. Um, so Jace is talking about the plan and, and trying to think through it in his mind because he's a tactical person. He's thinking about these things, etc. And one of the things that he asks is, do they even care? They being Nicol Bolas and Liliana. Do they even Do care? They even lift, bro. <laughs> God. I mean, Bolas does. I don't. I doubt Liliana does. She lifts the chain veil. She, and puts she it lifts on her face. zombies. Yeah, right. Raises them from the dead. Yeah, very nice. Um, and he thinks, do they care about the Eternals dying? Right, because that was kind of a big sticking point for the novel. Is that why not just go after Bolas? Like, you, you start your plan to go after Bolas. You've got, I could be wrong, but if I recall, it was like 
Gideon and Teferi and like somebody else who are like making their way to the to the uh, plaza where Bolus is on top of the it's not a pyramid what Citadel. is it Citadel thank you Amy hates it that they call it a pyramid because <laughs> it's not a pyramid it's, it's got a flat not top a pyramid. it's not a pointy top uh, <laughs> so in my mind it's not a pyramid there well you're correct it's got a flat top pyramids are point anyway they're making their way to the Citadel and. Then the Eternals all come out. And so, sure, they've got to go back and check because that's where Jace and Chandra were, and so they want to make sure everyone's safe. But then they're like, well, now we have to save all the Ravnikans. Just split up. And, and obviously they did that in terms of, like, stopping the Immortal Sun and turning the portal off yeah, or whatever. Split the party. Yeah, exactly. We learned that. You know that in D&D. &D. Don't split mm -hmm. the party ever. But if the whole plan is... Touch Bolus with the Black Blade. Right. That's all you have to do. Just touch him. There's no barrier around him. Why do you waste so much time right. with let's save everybody? Just because they're so even it's like. It's a game of capture the flag, right? All you have to do is get to the other end. Mm -hmm. And instead, you're letting all the sideways distractions stop you from getting that flag. Right. And, and, and that was kind of Jace's point. I mean, Liliana brings it up first earlier on and is like, they're dumb, right? They're fighting my the Eternals that I'm controlling and why aren't they just going after Bolas? Or, you know, the, of course they're going to be the heroes and try to save all the Ravnikans. And Jace is thinking the same thing. He's like, I don't even think they care that all these Eternals are dying. On top of that, there it's is... like. It's just like real armies. <laughs> being tactically poor? No, just being like controlled by whoever they're controlled by, you know, politicians, generals, whatever, mm -hmm. and being treated like each one of those individual people are just disposable, right? Send them in to get mowed down because then it's not me. Fought. Right? Fought. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. It was a, a bit interesting that, that that is the route that they went, and Jace kind of questions it as well, but then it gets brushed under the rug, or, or he convinces himself that it makes sense, or whatever nonsense. And then there's this rhythmic thumping noise. And there's, like, intrigue now. It's like, okay, what's the rhythmic thumping noise? Let's figure it out. This is cool. And so the rhythmic thumping happens, and it continues happening, and we see it's Vitugazi. And it's being controlled by Nyssa. Yeah. And Chandra had seen Nyssa previously, and now Nyssa is controlling Vitugazi, and Vitugazi is waltzing up. Yeah. And it's this huge, triumphant moment for Ravnica, and everybody's super happy. Really, the good guys in general, right? Not just Ravnica. Right. The Planeswalkers, too. Um, and Vitugazi strolls up, and based on the flavor text on the card, we know that this is true, but, like, knocks over that Bola statue that's been in the middle of Ravnica that's been, like, looking over everybody. And and even Bolas gets a little upset by this, um, but the Ravnikans are super happy about it. And so there's that moment, though, of, like, what's that rhythmic thumping noise? What is it? And, like, we as the reader are like, what is it? We don't know. We knew earlier that Nyssa was around, and we knew that eventually she was going to animate Vitugazi, but we didn't necessarily know that the thumping was Vitugazi showing up. We were like, oh, God, what is this now? Right, you know? suspense. Right. And then it was Vitugazi, and everybody was super happy. And then there's more rhythmic thumping. But this time, you're not as afraid. You're not as right. tense about it, because you're like, well, the last time it was rhythmic thumping, it was awesome, so it's going to be great again, right? No. Right? No. Then it was the God Eternals. And the God Eternals show up and just beat the crap out of Vitugazi, because it's now one on four, and they're all the same size. Yeah. Um, so they, they beat up Vitugazi, and Nyssa is, like, reacting to all the different punches and kicks and attacks or whatever. Because they hurt her. Which is awesome. That's so cool that, like, you get that perspective of Jace watching Vitugazi getting beaten up and then looking and seeing Nyssa, like, recoiling in pain and, and wincing and etc. But she's still keeping control. And then finally, they rip Vitugazi's arm off. And then Nyssa's, like relinquishes control over Vitugazi, Vitugazi collapses, and Nyssa collapses. Yeah. It's such a cool moment. It sucks, but it's a very cool moment. Right. And it was written... And it's a part that actually kind of makes sense 
as opposed to feeling sort of manufactured and, and placed in um, sort of out of place. Right. <clears throat> so I thought that was very, very cool. Uh, and a, there, you know, there's an organicness to it. Pardon right. the pun, because... <laughs> nice. Very nice. I hadn't even thought of it, but that's very good. Um, Amy, something else that you had wanted to bring up, and again, if you are unaware, uh, Nissa, this lady's favorite planeswalker, so yes. let's let's keep continue talking about Jace and Nissa. Okay. And let's talk about Jace's interaction with Nissa, where he describes his interaction with Nissa as like a summer rain. It's I loved that description because um first thing I thought of was uh her interactions with Yeheni, where Yeheni um, saw her become part blue, basically. Mm -hmm. um, sensed it. Right. They sensed it, excuse me. Um, it, summer rain, to me, meant green-blue. Um, to me, meant... Um, He, to, to me, it meant a quick, cute reference to the fact that she's green-blue, regardless of whether that manifests itself in this set. Correct. Because Does that makes sense? Because like, in this set, she's mono-green, so that's a fair point. She's mono-green in this set, um, and even if she wasn't, right, um, I feel like, um, and even if... In the novel, we don't get to see her be green and blue. You know, um, it's it's important that someone like Jace, who is so close to her, um, who was there in the set where she was green blue, um, and who is a blue planeswalker himself, who debatably is so much more powerful and smart and whatever else than he used to be. Yes. Um, it's, it's a great thing to see them sort of harken back to that. Um, if, if anyone's going to describe her that way, it ought to be him. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and he did. So that's really cool. Well, and, and don't forget, we never heard from Nyssa, quote unquote, heard from her in this novel in that, we heard dialogue from her from the perspective of other planeswalkers. Mm -hmm. She was never the focus of a chapter. Mm -hmm. At least I don't believe so. Maybe she was um, one. You know, I they, don't remember. Well, very but. frequently I thought that they that they named a chapter after a character that didn't seem to necessarily make sense as the name of the chapter. Mm -hmm. um, so she might have been named as a chapter name, but... It, it didn't necessarily um, uh, really get to the root of her. Right. And, and no then, like you said, it was sort of from other people's perspectives, yeah. never from hers and, and things like that. Yeah. And, and I think that that makes it even that much more perfect that Jace references the green-blue thing because she's not green-blue in this set. Right. So it would make more sense for none of this novel to be from her point of view because perhaps we would see some of that blue that doesn't actually exist in this set. Well, and she's currently pretty far removed from the other Planeswalkers mm -hmm. from the Gatewatch until the end where she kind of reaffirms her oath that she had abandoned originally but prior to the beginning of this story. Right. Um, and so... Throughout that, we don't know what her internal struggle looked like. Right. And perhaps it's her distance from her friends uh, that kind of eats away at that piece of her that is blue. Um, if, if you want to get real technical of, of that, that bit of flavor, that would maybe make sense. Um, that, that maybe, you know, barricading herself off... Um, kind of made her revert a little bit? Some might... Well, maybe. Because because her 
being with the Gate Watch is what led her to becoming part blue. And it's not not automatically just the influence of the Gate Watch, but just her gaining friendships with the likes of Chandra and Gideon and Jason, to a degree, I guess, Liliana, but not really, um, allowed her to tap into that part of herself. Right. And, and I mean, even her interactions with the puzzle of Kefnet on Amon Ket did that. But you could also say to a degree that Blue kind of can lend itself to isolation as well in that Blue are knowledge seekers. So it, they may be more apt to be the ones to sit in a library alone and read a book. You know, that, like to, to, to gain knowledge in that way. Although you can see with like the Izzet, for example, that they they kind of tend to be scientists and work together to formulate and gain knowledge and, and attain things. But so I don't know. I, I guess I could see both sides of it. But. And, and, and I would say, too, that it also kind of makes sense because back then, uh, and, and I'll reference it again because I always do, um, her interactions with Emrakul mm -hmm. um, very much made her become that knowledge seeker, right? Mm -hmm. Or or not even so much a knowledge seeker, but someone who got knowledge bestowed whether or not she was seeking it, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, her her distance from her friends and maybe even her distance from Emrakul at that point has has an effect on on her uh, amount of her that is blue or her, um, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the showing of it, you yes. know, the, the Manifestation. emergence of it, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a fair point And it's, it's interesting because I would be curious to see. And the thing that, you know, what sucks is that with the way that this book was written and we have the sequel book coming out soon, I don't know that I'm confident that we will get the appropriate sequel to some of these characters. Because I, it's very easy for me to say that I'm really interested to see how Nissa's interactions with the rest of the Gatewatch are now that she quit yeah. and then came back but she quit. She right. quit in front of all of them and just walked away. Walked away. Um, and now she's back, sure, and she retook her oath. But if it were the original writing team, the in-house writing team, I would look forward to the way that they decided to have Nyssa share her character by talking that out. Right. Now... I have no idea. I have no idea if they're going to do it correctly. I have no idea if they're going to do it well, incorrectly. And I have no idea. It's it's just in such flux right now that I struggle to say that I'm looking forward to hearing about what they want to do or, or are going to be doing with these characters. Well, the other point that can be made, too, is that when you're in a war, those things don't matter, right? Um, you know, you had a petty kind of fight with your friend and then all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, something much more serious happens, like your friend's moving away, um, very, very far and you probably are never going to see them again. Um, so maybe in that situation, you kind of let bygones be bygones right. and instead of <clears throat> actually maybe having that adequate characterization where we actually see the A to B um, sort of transform, um, the person just kind of switches that part off. They just kind of let that disappointment in their friend fall away um, so that they can uh, appreciate the time that they have left with them. Yeah. Um, Fair point. You know, um, in... in in the circumstance that they're now being uh, presented. Right. No, it's a, that's a, a very fair point. And it, I'd like to say that I'm interested to see what happens. Because I don't, we have no information whatsoever on this sequel. Not right. at all. Except that it's the same author. That's yeah. the only thing we know. And take that for what it is. We'll talk about that next week. Um, but the prequel too. I mean, we also don't know 
what information is in the prequel. Well, some um, people do. The four chapters have been released at the time of recording. We just haven't read them yet because we'll be reviewing them at a later date. Because okay. we're working on the novel right now. But my point is, we don't know Correct. what information Sorry. has been presented in the prequel stories. So there might be things that we're thinking, well, they might sort of come back to referencing this in the sequel, or they might have already referenced it in the prequels. We just didn't get to read that before reading this because... Right. I mean, we, uh, can, we can pretty confidently... Because balls were dropped. <laughs> we can pretty confidently say that nothing about Nyssa is in here, it is in the prequels, um, just because it's only on Ravnica, the prequels. Okay. So... I can relatively confidently say that. Again, I haven't read them yet, but... Anyway. Well, but that doesn't mean that characters can't have conversations about her while she's not there. I don't know that any of the people that are on Ravnica that are not the Gatewatch know her. And I don't know that the Gatewatch are part of their prequel stories. Oh. Okay. It's all things we don't know. We will have to wait and see. I, I genuinely I have no so. idea. We will, we will wait and see. We will see. Moving away from Jace and from Chapter 25 and from Nyssa, let's move on to Teo. Because I want to talk about Teo. Okay. I'm going to read a quote from the book. And it's the only quote in all my notes that I actually wrote down. It's kind of a long one, so I apologize. It's like a paragraph. But it was awesome. And I loved it. And I wrote it down. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read this quote. And then we can talk about why I love it. Because, by the way, this is an example of a positive thing that I'm going to talk about. Teo had come to realize that Gobekan with its diamond storms and monks, its humans, dwarves, and jinn, was a rather tame world, relative not just to Ravnica, but to every other plane that every other planeswalker hailed from. He no longer felt overwhelmed by this. He was so far beyond the concept of being overwhelmed that the remarkable, the astounding, the sensational washed over him like the unending wheel of the sky, leaving him in a permanent state of awed wonder to which he was simply growing accustomed. I love that paragraph. I think, based on my reading of <laughs> the rest of this novel and the rat parallel stories, it doesn't sound like Greg Weissman. Right. It's, it's the best language uh, of the entire novel. It's, it's amazing. Absolutely incredible. And but it also has a profoundness to it. Absolutely. Um, and it, it speaks so much to Teo and Teo's character arc in this novel. It's just it it just it struck me so much that I needed to I needed to write it down and I really wanted to be able to talk about it. So Yeah, I mean it struck me a lot um, as as a person who struggles with anxiety and a person who um, struggles uh, with having been uh, uh, with living in an abusive household uh, growing up, um, it 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 reminded me kind of of um, of an abuse victim basically to say um, that sort of uh, the things that overwhelm me or the things that make me anxious are the types of things that most people are fine dealing with. Um, and the, the things that would normally uh, overwhelm and um, make people anxious uh, uh, are sort of intense situations. Um, and those are the kinds of things that I'm sort of more at home in, uh, simply because uh, those were the things that, as a child, I was constantly dealing with. Um, so it, it really reminded me of that and sort of just, um, just a, a good description of what it means to be an, abu an abuse victim. Um, to, to kind of have that sort of odd reversal, I guess, of, of what, of, of what it 
means to to kind of constantly be in that sort of heightened um, adrenaline fight or flight mode. Um, you the the things that you're able to get through when you're in that mode are um, much more impactful and, and crazy and terrifying and um, uh, terrifying um, and and the things that are harder for you to get through are the things that are much more simple um, so I really liked that quote for that reason it, it definitely uh, sort of mirrored my life at least in in my interpretation of it and, and I apologize for for mischaracterizing we both wanted that quote included because we both loved it. I mean, we were, I was reading it in the car. We were driving. And I remember after reading that paragraph, we both just kind of stopped and just sat for a minute and took it in because it was so good. And so we, I, I apologize. We both wanted that included right. and, and for different reasons, because that is where Amy's experiences are from. And that is what it prompted her to, to think of. And thank you for that analysis. What I thought of, more so now, having read the whole novel and having rewritten the quote and then knowing that there were things that I wanted to talk about with regards to Teo today, I wanted to talk about Teo's whole arc in general okay. in that when we first see Teo, he's on Gobicon. He's with his monk teacher whose name or title I don't remember, but it's the guy who's in charge of the Shield Masters and is just like constantly on Teo about like, you're doing it wrong, you know, you gotta be safe or whatever. And it's it, up, dude. And 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 to the point where, and this is something that I've seen through uh media, television, movies, documentaries, etc. Um, of when a teacher is verbally beating down a student, the other students tend to feel empowered to pile that on as well. Because they are seeing the authority figure bullying to a degree. I don't know that that's necessarily the best word here, but bullying Teo in this position into feeling that he's not good enough. Right. And and that might just be the teacher's way of trying to like push him right. to do better. Tough love or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. And... It's but it also did have an effect on the other kids, and therefore then also an effect on Teo. Right, a, a was, stronger effect. That yeah. was more profound than uh, the 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 teacher intended. Right, and now let's be aware of the fact that Teo very well may have been that bad at being a shield master or a shield mage is the word I was the, the word I was looking for, not master, but a shield mage. He may have been that bad at it. He may not have, but he may have been that bad. And if he was, again, maybe that was the teacher's teaching method. But once he planeswalked, once he got his spark or his spark ignited and he planeswalked to Ravnica, slowly to quickly throughout this story, this novel, he grew more and more and more powerful as the novel went on. And it was little things here and there of, you know, being able to quickly throw up a shield as opposed to when he was on Gobicon, he like had to really think about it. Like I found my vertice and now I have to find my second and my third. And I can only make triangles, even though they're not as strong as circles or squares or whatever, yeah. you know, and, and yet, and, and he had to like chant under his breath. Um, and then when he got to Ravnica, he would start by chanting under his breath, but then the next thing you know, he's making four corner ones really easily, and then, like, he's throwing up circles every now and then, and he's throwing, like, little circles at enemies to kind of distract them or get their attention. Um, and then he he doesn't have to chant anymore, and, and this and that. And it's just incremental increases in his power that, if you know to look for it, are really cool little moments but if you're glossing over it, you may miss it, where you're like, oh, okay, whatever, it's a four-corner shield. It's like, yeah, but he couldn't do that before. And now to him, because he's in a war, mm -hmm. right? He's dealing with these enemies that are trying to kill him and his newfound friends, the people that he trusts at this point in this right. new world, he's just reacting. 
He's right. just doing these things, but he's growing in power. He's right. growing in his abilities and in what he's doing. Right. So there's a necessity, right? Um, which obviously makes that um, it, the, the need much more important. Um, but also, he doesn't have somebody looking over his shoulder telling him how terrible he right. is. Critiquing um, every little thing that he's doing and yelling at him. Right. So instead of <clears throat> spending all his time trying to get each individual intricacy of, of what he's supposed to do, right? Um, he's just, like you said, reacting. Um, he's just letting... Um, the instincts take over. Even. Right. And, 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 and trying to do what he can to, to help. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that propels what he can do, um, forward, as and opposed to keeping him in those intricacies, um, where he can't get out of them. And, and honestly, this is in the third third, but I'm going to talk about it now. The arc, in my mind, kind of closes, and I feel like no one talked about it in the novel or, you know, people discussing the book that I've seen elsewhere. Teo held off Kefnet. Alone. Yeah. With a shield. Yeah. A god eternal, a giant, a, I mean, a god. He held off a god with his shield. The kid who was getting yelled at because he couldn't stop diamonds that were flying at him stopped, I think, two punches from a god and saved arguably all of Ravnica because he saved all of the um, guild leaders who formed back together to create Niv-Mizzet Reborn. If he wasn't there to stop Kefnet... Niv Mizzet Reborn would not have happened, which means Liliana would not have gotten the assistance that she got from Niv Mizzet at the end to kill Bolas. Again, he's not dead, but to, to get Niv Mizzet to stab Bolas with Hazaret's spear. Teo did that. Teo held off Kefnet long enough for Niv Mizzet to come up and cut the arm off and, and then take Kefnet down himself. Niv-Mizzet's going to be the one who's going to be credited with... Niv-Mizzet's the one who killed Kefnet. Right. Sure. Because Teo couldn't. But Teo still held off a god. Right. As a child. I mean, like, in, in, especially in comparison. A child who was a poor shield mage. But the people on Ravnica didn't know that. Right. The Planeswalkers didn't know that. He, I think, maybe mentioned it to Rat that he like wasn't good or whatever, but Rat trusted him and, and respected him and maybe grew to love him, whether that's romantic or just friendship, who cares? That's really neither here nor there, but but grew to love him and, and, and trust him and his abilities, especially as she saw them growing throughout their time together and throughout his time on Ravnica. And it leads me to, I guess, again, the third third, but then we won't have to talk about Teo next week necessarily, at the end of the, the story, Teo stays. And I don't know, like, I toyed with this a lot when I was writing these notes down. I genuinely don't know if I would have rather seen Teo go back with his newfound power and abilities, or if he would just wouldn't have been appreciated. And so it's better for him to stay on Ravnica, say, screw those guys, I have no need to go back. I owe them nothing, I will prove nothing to them. And just stay in a place where he's actually respected on Ravnica and not ever have to worry about going back to that place of Gobicon ever again. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, a kid that gets persistently bullying, bullied um, changing schools, right? Clean slate. Yeah. You know, now you get to be the person you didn't know you could be. Because the whole time you were being told you couldn't be that person. Right. Um, you know, and then when you're in that situation, 
uh, do you ever want to go back to your old school and, and try to rub it in their faces? No. You, you want to live the life that you were able to gain from leaving. Mm -hmm. um, you, you want to live your better life, the life that you um, were able to create yeah. rather than the life that you got dealt. Right, and, and, and with people who love and trust and respect you. Right. Because isn't that worth it? I mean, and I don't know offhand how much of Teo's improvements and, and mastery, if you will, of the shield mage abilities were from his increase in power from being a planeswalker, right? From sparking. And how much of it was just from the fact that he had a chance, weirdly, I'm saying this and I mean it, but that he had a chance to breathe. Mm -hmm, yeah. Even though he was literally fighting for his life and the life of his friends at any given moment, he wasn't also being yelled at and critiqued and belittled the whole time. And so even though it was life-threatening, as opposed to, you know, he could have, on Gobicon, he could have kind of hid behind the other shield mages and kind of put up like a, a half-assed shield and he still would have been okay from the Diamond Storms. Here, he didn't have anybody else to hide behind. He right. had to be the one to put up those shields himself. But... Yeah, there he, was no one else right. to do that for him. Right. But he wasn't... It, it meant that he didn't have time to second guess. Right. He just did, as was necessary. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I thought that, obviously then, that Teo could not have been mischaracterized because this was the only characterization we had. Right. But I thought Teo had an actual arc. Yeah. I thought Kaya, I, we talked about her a little bit earlier, I thought she, that it was fine. I, I, I don't think it was perfect, but I think her arc was fine in terms of, of being able to be closed out. I think that when you get into more, my, I'll try that again. When you get into much more established characters like the Gatewatch Five mm -hmm. Plus, um, that's where you run into, or, or or older characters like Karn and Teferi, that's where you run into people getting upset with characterization because, right. rightfully so, because either there wasn't enough time, or, or there now were all of a sudden they're doing things that it wouldn't make sense for them to do, saying right. things that. Wouldn't make sense for them to say. Right. And, and whether that is Greg Weissman truly not having a, the opportunity to know these characters, or whether it's a pure lack of communication from uh, Greg's liaisons within the Wizard story team, we obviously have no idea. But that's really neither here nor there. I think that unless you have anything more. Or, or, or whether that lack of, that sort of lack of characterization is simply due to the fact that that the book wasn't about individual characterization so much as it was about uh, the, the the battle. Yeah. Um, so they kind of uh, sped quickly past a lot of the uh, less significant things. And I only say that they're less significant because um, if they didn't drive that plot forward, uh, they weren't included. Yeah, and I, I think I brought up earlier the, the idea of people not uh, having to spend all that time fighting the Eternals to save the citizens of Ravnica solely because of the fact that if you wanted a 360-page novel or approximately that, you could have cut out that whole middle section and actually given some characterization, mm. actually had some conversations and some, some character building for your primary characters as opposed to your secondary or tertiary characters who became characters in the forefront because of the needs of the novel and the story? Yeah, well, um, the other thing is, too, if you if you look at what the sort of timeline of the story is, um, it's really just like a day or two's worth of time. Oh, yeah. Which isn't a lot of time for dialogue and characterization, especially when um, the task at hand is so involved and um, uh, dire. Right. Right. And, the, and the, that's why, I've, I mean, again, I've heard good things about the prequel stories. We haven't had a chance, but we will get there, don't you worry. Um, but once we do, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And, and 
seeing whether the prequel stories, after having read them, will spur me to want to read through the novel a second time mm -hmm. to see what we may have missed because of the complete and utter screw-up of right. not releasing them in the, in the right order, which is almost unforgivable. Right. It's just, it's just that pathetic and annoying. I, I didn't want to end it on that sour of a note because we just talked about Teo and the really cool characterization of Teo. So, right. so what I will say to end this off is who stopped Kefnet? I believe that part of that goes to, like part of that goes to Teo to some degree. He didn't hurt Kefnet in some way, but he held off a god right. long enough to allow the good guys, Niv Mizzet, to step in and take care of him. And so I think part of that goes to Teo. I just don't think he gets the recognition that he deserves. Right. So, Absolutely. you know. Um, but for now, that's going to be the end of this, part two of our review of War of the Spark Ravnica by Greg Weissman. So I want to thank you all very much for watching and for hanging out for any and all of this video and the last video that you did. Um... And stay tuned next week where we will be back with what will hopefully be the finale. If we feel like it needs four parts, we might, but I'd rather keep it to three if we can. Yeah, I don't think we're going to need I mean, we've already referenced a lot of uh, later parts uh, kind of right now. Yeah. So and I've got, I've got I notes. I feel like we've got uh, less to talk about yeah. in the next one. Yeah, I've got notes. We will, we will figure it out. But regardless, thank you all so much for hanging out with us. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed, and please leave any thoughts, comments, critiques, or um, kind of back and forth that you want to have with us. Right. Do you agree with things that we said? Do you disagree with anything that we said? Please feel free to leave that in the comments below. It is a really great way to show off your... Hashtag Vorthos Pride. It was a lot smoother than I feel like I've done it recently. <laughs> so, Congrats. And, hey, you know, pat myself on the back, I guess. Thank you. That was very condescending, and I appreciate it. Uh, love you. <laughs> love you, too. So, <laughs> this has been another episode of JAR here on Geek for All. I have been Joe. And I, Mimi. Don't forget, we hope we will see you all on Monday for our preview stream. We are really looking forward to it. Thank you to Wizards of the Coast for the sponsorship. And as we always say, in whichever video of ours you watch next, we will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody.